So this is me on a daily basis. Totally quiet and unassuming, this is my new business <coughs> photo. Um, but the guys at the APG said, don't be you. We need you to be more noisy and provocative. And, I, and this really isn't me, the only thing noisy is my mic. Um, and I had to really try for this photo, but I, I'm gonna try and be a bit provocative-ish. Um, so the topic is the art of persuasion. Uh, really, I'm just gonna talk about making ideas happen. Um, and this became really important to me very early on. I used to work with a guy called Tiago de Marais, who is absolutely wonderful. This is his illustration, that's him on the right. And he had a book on his desk, which was underneath his map called Killed Ideas, and it was volume two. And when stuff died, he would write in his book. And I thought, shit, it's volume two. Um, and it's just really important f to make ideas happen, ultimately. It's a really important topic. Because ideas don't exist until you make them happen. So there's lots of talk in this industry. I'm going to do some talking. Um, but really, until things happen, th there's just nothing at all. Um, so hey, planners, because there's a lot of you in the room, like PowerPoint doesn't really count. I know there's an irony I'm presenting on PowerPoint, <laughs> but it doesn't really count. You have to influence people. You have to make stuff happen. And I've got 10 tricks for making ideas happen, and I'm going to do it in about eight minutes. Um, one small caveat, I like this uh, quote from Ricky Gervais, the best I advice I've ever received is no one else knows what they're doing either. I don't really. These are all just slightly bullshit things that might help. Uh, but see what you think. Uh, the first trick is make it everyone's. So Bridget, who works at uh, AMV, who I worked for for five years, is wonderful. And she said, uh, we embrace what we create. So when you feel part of something, you put your heart into it. And the more you can make it feel like everyone's idea, the better. So rather than going around the agency going, I've had an idea. Uh, start talking about we've had a thing and try and make everyone feel like it's theirs. It's really important that like, lots of people try to claim ideas in agencies and that is the wrong thing to do in my experience. So start thinking about we uh, and get everyone to do their thing. So increasingly the ideas that we're trying to create are now about a gang of people coming around it with specialisms and the more you can make them feel like they are doing their bit to make it better, you will get, you will be on to something. Uh, we recently did a campaign for FIFA uh, where we made a move in the game with Cristiano Ronaldo, which was a virtual move that it influenced the real world. And lots and lots of people came into contact with that to make it happen. Social media, the design of the game, everything, the TV ad. But there were lots of bits to it, even the cultural stuff with Adidas that we did. But ultimately, it got to the end of that campaign, and my boss, uh, DG, said, oh, whose idea was it? And I was like, everyone's. Like, it was everyone's. There were 30 people who worked on it. Second uh, trick is nail the problem, especially you planners in the room. Um, if you agree objectives up front, idea judging becomes more objective. If you can start to then, rather than have fanciful, indulgent, creative ideas that look like you're trying to sort of disappearing up your own arse, suddenly they become lateral solutions to a shared problem, and then it becomes harder to argue with them. Um, an example of that recently that I worked on was Marmite. So we said it was all about trial. Like, don't forget anything else. This is about getting people to try Marmite, even if they've tried it in the past, get them to pick it up again. Uh, and more specifically, we got to this, get parents who hate Marmite to still get their kids to try it for breakfast. So when we presented the Marmite gene test kit, they went, actually, that's not that mad because it will get people around the breakfast table talking about whether they love Marmite. And if they love it, their kids hate it. And so right, if we'd just gone with that off the bat, I think they probably wouldn't have bought it. But it was baked into the problem. Third thing is beat the system. So. Lots of your clients will have to do research. They will just have to as part of their organizations. But don't hate them for doing that. Hate the game, hate the research game. And I know Flamingo are here, so I, I, David Burroughs is looking at me a bit weird. Uh, but here's, here's the thing that I wanted to just explain about it. So take the test, if there's a quant test, and know exactly how it works. Because once you actually take that test, you'll realize how to critique it, but also how to make your stimulus work better. Um, bias the stimulus. Uh, if you've got qual groups, make sure the music's good, make sure the boards are good, kind of make the reference as good as it can possibly be. I once got an ad through research by saying it would be a bit like a Nike ad <laughs> and, it, and, it, and got away with it because sometimes you can cheat it, um, which I know is not the right thing to do, but sometimes you have to to get an idea through. Um, beware false positives. So it's easy to do research and go, well, it did quite well. People kind of liked it, but sometimes that's not good. Um, actually, sometimes saying we want something a bit more divisive. So going into this research, some people aren't really, really like it, but some people will really love it. Actually might prep clients in the right way in the same way as pre-warn them against negatives. So maybe it's uh, a new campaign for a brand. So maybe the branding won't be quite so good. Or maybe there's no new news. So persuasion might not be so good. All of those things, talk to them about it in advance because then they're prepped as to why it might not be quite where it needs to be. 
Um, also influence the debrief. The more you can talk to research agencies and frame the same data in slightly different ways or create different competitive sets, the better. Uh, and avoid the middle. So this is something which Les and Sarah, Adam and Eve talk about a lot, which is uh, research at the beginning to get lovely cultural insight and territory and richness and kind of make sure you've got the right kind of insights. Then don't really do anything in the middle where you're trying to draw emotions. Research once it's made at the end and see its impact in the real world. The more you can avoid the middle, the better. And actually lots of our best clients don't research in the middle at all. John Lewis do not do that. They only do right at the beginning and right at the end. Um, Four, be brutally honest. Um, I think sometimes with clients it's okay to say it's not good enough and just be really, really honest about it. Because um, sometimes arguments can be a good thing. I once was asked to leave the room by a client for being too argumentative about why I thought the work was right and they literally asked me to leave the room. But four years later they're now a client at Adam and Eve because they respected the fact that I wanted to protect the work. And you know, I think that stands you in good stead because Honesty builds trust. If you can be, rather than trying to ultimately sell work you don't believe in, because we've all done that, where you go into a room and you kind of, you sort of know it's not quite where it needs to be. And the more you do that, it slightly chips away at your soul, um, one. But also clients then don't trust you. Whereas if you say it's not good enough, then ultimately I think you end up getting to better work. So when I worked at Widen and Kennedy, we moved a meeting back three times. And Honda were like, what the fuck? We've got, we need to launch a campaign in November. Why are you moving this meeting? What is the problem? And we just said, we don't think we've got anything good enough yet. And what happened was when we walked into the room, they knew that we did. They knew we had one thing and they, they knew that we all believed in it and they bought it instantly. Five, pray on the week. So it's much easier to get uh, work through clients that really need to change something. Um, so where it's kind of riskier to do nothing than to take a risk. Now that's not always the case, but particularly with challenger brands, they're more up for stuff generally. So when I worked on three, we went to them and said, would it be bonkers to do free roaming? And they sort of said, yeah, kind of bonkers, but actually the EU might change the law and it would cost O2 250 million. It wouldn't cost us that much because we don't have that many customers anyway. And so you start, they start to go, yeah, do you know what? Let's, let's go for it. And, and that's the kind of, that's the way to sort of get to clients and, and get them to really buy the best stuff. And um, even a client that's doing really well, this is a classic narrative I've nicked from Michael Lee, but he is a friend of mine, so he won't mind. Um, everything's been going really well, kind of stability, that's where you can flatter a client. Then there's a change in worlds, there's a threat, there's jeopardy, there's kind of something which actually means you're under threat. Luckily, we've got something really clever that's going to reframe things. And then look at this creative idea, it's going to make it amazing. So you manage to go start high, then threat, then kind of redemption and then something brilliant. And the more you can tell that story, even with clients who are doing well, the more likely you are to sell stuff, I think. Six is find your charisma. This is like a really, really bad end line. And I read the BBH thing about lines that say find your, uh, but it's not an end line. It's just me trying to describe what this is. Um, ultimately, it might be you. You might be the reason they're not buying the idea. Um, you need to find what is going to appeal to them about yourself. You've got to sort of be more likable. They're buying you, not just your ideas. Um, and I'm glad Jim's here because I read something on his blog that I really liked, which is generally what happens in appraisals, particularly early in your career, is people tell you to be someone else. They go, well, you're not analytical enough, or do you know what, you don't get excited enough, or you need to think things through more, or you get a bit impassioned. And, and actually, I just think the older I've got, I read the blog and I totally agree that you should just accentuate your natural positives. If you get really excited, be really excited. If you're quiet and analytical and don't want to say much, don't say much, just say the most important thing in the room. Um, this is Dave Trott said this, I really like it, energy beats talent. Generally I just go around the agency getting excited about stuff and it sort of seems to work for me because the more you get excited everyone else kind of gets excited um, and optimism is really infectious so if you go in sort of bouncing and smiling people go, they've got to have something good. Like Craig Inglis at John Lewis, he always says, <laughs> he said the other day and now we have to watch ourselves, I know when you've got something good because of the way you walk in the room, it's like oh shit. But like think, just think about that when you walk in, like you make that impression. Um, because it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. So it's tone and it's body language and all of that comes across. Also make it personal. I, probably everyone's seen this Mad Men scene. By making it a personal story, suddenly everyone wants to listen. We're human beings. The more you can make it personal, the better in terms of getting an idea sold. And if you're the planner, quite a good role to adopt is just be the one who calmly explains why it would work at the end, often. Because once you get emotional feels plus 
rational reassurance when you're presenting an idea. You've sort of got both sides of the coin. You're doing system one, system two. That, mo that works for the majority of clients generally. Seven is mirror their personality. So this is something which is an Adam and Eve training course. You've basically got four types of people you've got. The, the way to think about this is if um, your client missed their flight, would they be analytical and work out when the next flight is, how long it would take them to get to another airport, whether they can change somewhere else, all of those things and basically work through all the analytics. Would they march up and go, hey, I've got an Amex card and you need to get me on the next flight and be a kind of driver? Would they sort of get really upset or cry about it or get kind of just really emotional? Or would they just worry what everyone else is going to think? And once you begin to think about where people are and you can then mirror them, you're far more likely to create a connection because there is this unconscious bias around people liking people who are like them. It just happens in life. It's generally why people just hire people a bit like themselves, unfortunately. Um, and so if you can mirror people, that tends to work really well. This is Ian Pearman. I used to work with him. He was unbelievable at walking into a room and he would go from, all right, fella, and just be really kind of funny to, I've got a Harvard MBA and I'm very analytical. And he would do both. And it was a very natural thing but it was wonderfully effective at creating connections with clients almost instantly. And I'd go, this is not him, but it, it would work. He would just kind of work the room really brilliantly. Um, number eight is walking their shoes. Actually, Matt briefly touched on this. Just a few questions to think of. So what would get your client a promotion? Most of them are looking to leave in the next one to three years or feel like they need a promotion. So what would get them one? What might get them the new job? What would ultimately impress their boss. That's what most clients are trying to do. That's what we're all really trying to do. Um, so try and think about it in those terms, like what would, what would sort of get them that extra pay rise or extra promotion? Um, what would show they get the rhetoric? So if you're going into Unilever and you're not talking about purpose, you're unlikely to get anywhere. If you're going into Mars and you're not talking about Byron Sharp and memory structures and fame, you're unlikely to get anywhere. You've just got to face into these things and frame your idea in the right way because your clients will be thinking about that all the time. Number nine is get real. Um, this was actually Jess, who's my work wife, gave me this one. Um, so I don't want to take too much credit, but maybe it's not one of the best. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this was about show and tell. So we often do telling and we tell a story, but actually just showing and demonstrating things can be really powerful. So go one step further and make it feel possible. One small example with Skittles. We mocked up that pack and took it in, and it became a prop. And the client went, can I take that? and just so I can show my boss. And it just made them think, actually, this could be on the shelves. It's not as impossible as it seems. Um, another thing is prototypes they can play with, increasing with the ideas we make. The more we can make them happen and give clients a thing. That's how we sold Honda Type R. We actually mocked it up so they could type R on the keyboard. But we had um, Ryan Gosling in Drive and then some kind of generic like Middle England thing. And the client was going, mm, 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 mm. and then we were like, now imagine that they're driving. He was sold. And he said, can I have that to just go and show my boss? It's just making it really practical. And then number 10 is simple, stealable summaries. So you will soon realize, if you haven't already, that no one can really remember what happened in the meeting apart from the biscuits. Like you'll get to the end and you'll be like, what was that all about? And so the more you can just give clients the killer pitch on a page, the one chart that they can literally take and pass on, the better. Often even better if it's a film, a one minute film that just goes, here's the challenge, so here's what we've done, and here's the idea, and isn't it exciting? So they can literally just press play. We did that recently with a client, and the next week it was at a global conference. And we're like, oh, that's sold then. And if we hadn't made the film, probably wouldn't have got that far. Um, because most of the selling actually generally happens afterwards to their boss and their boss's boss. And the more you can give people a very simple tool to do that, the better. And you can avoid corporate Chinese whispers where the idea becomes something else and then comes back to you. If you've written it very simply or it's a film, they can't change the film. Uh, and then I saw this, I think Amelia Turode retweeted it. And I really liked it. Uh, there are two types of smart people in the world, people who make simple things complicated and people who make complicated things simple. And if you're a planner in the room, in fact, if you're generally anyone in the room, um, be this guy. And the more you can do that at the end and give that simple summary, the better. They will nick that, trust me, and they will keep repeating it. So be that guy. And with that in mind, I've got my 10 things. So make it everyone's, nail the problem, beat the system research-wise, but play nicely with Flamingo. Um, Four, be brutally honest. Five, prey on the weak. Six, find your charisma. Seven, mirror their personality. Eight, walk in their selfish shoes. Nine, get real. And 10, write simple, stealable summaries. And that's me done in about 10 minutes.